in sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 Drive to Survive, Untold, and many more now on Netflix. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Seria Chronicles is a Maya Chronicles production. I thought Lukaku was really good in this game. I really do. And everyone's going to crucify me for that because he didn't score some chances, but he actually played a good team game in this game. He had some great flicks. He, he, he was really involved up until the point where he could not score. He could not score. <laughs> everybody and welcome to the Seria Chronicles podcast. Uh, you join me at the exact moment that Mina Rizuki just found out how much Kunin Mbappe makes and she's not sure about it. It's not really related to Seria, but Mina, have you just, you, you, I feel like you're, you're going through an existential crisis <laughs> after finding out how much Mbappe makes. I don't know if you guys watch Instagram as much as I do, but I'm like really big into like TikTok reels and all of the stuff. And basically like the song that's really famous at the moment is Miley Cyrus's, you know, I can buy myself flowers. And now they've done all these different um, sort of songs that's like, I want a rich man. <laughs> and everyone's going, yeah, you could buy yourself flowers because you're Miley Cyrus and you're rich. And I'm thinking, God, can you imagine how lovely it would be to be married to somebody like Mbappe? Or you just don't have to like, you know, I don't know, you know, just wonder what next contract you're going to sign. <laughs> like just, it would make life simpler, wouldn't it? It's funny that that's like the song because I'm I'm not very across all of the TikTok culture, but I do know that my two nieces who are nine and six who are not on TikTok, but they have been playing that that same song a lot because I'm currently away on Easter holidays with them in Italy. Um, this background you can see behind me if anyone's watching, I Mina can see it. Is actually not my my usual background. It's a little Agri Turismo. We're staying in um, my dad's old hometown. And yes, they've been playing flowers a lot. So I've been hearing a lot of flowers. I quite like it. It's a good message like it is. For, for little girls. A positive message. It's empowering. Absolutely. I mean, empowering for sure. Can you marry Mbappe? Yes, I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, this just comes to the point where I can't explain it to you, Nikki. Like, I just went for a mini walk on Saturday because, you know, it was like such lovely weather and I just sort of needed to get out of the house, you know, because it was just, it, it just got to too much football, <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I'm not going to watch Roma Torino. You know, it's like it's like wanting to shoot yourself in the face, right? With two defensive teams. I did record it. I watched it later. I'm not possibly maybe walked like honestly not more than like I don't know two miles, and my whole body is sore. <laughs> I just feel like I don't know <laughs> if I can hold on to like 55 or maximum 60. But I just think 55. I'm just so tired, and like it's just. It's a lot. It's a lot of watching football. It's a lot of like, I don't know, it's a hustling kind of job. And I, yeah, like, wouldn't it be nice to just, I don't know, marry back and be like, listen, you do you. You live your life, you know? I'll just, I'm here if you need me. <laughs> it's a very hands off kind of marriage. <laughs> you can sort of understand why I'm not married because I'm always like, you do whatever you want to do, babe, <laughs> you know? And I'm just here if you want to chat. <laughs> I um, love this. Um, we're possibly getting off topic. Yes. I, um, I just wanted to share with them before we go on to the football, the, the wonderful traditions of my dad's hometown, because it's been the most ridiculous sort of stuff going on here. Tell us. In like Italy, lots of people will know about, I think some of the listeners might already know about like in big Italian cities, there are certain like traditions. So like in Fiorentina, in Firenze, there's a calcio storico which is historic football, which is a very violent game. Like it doesn't look that much like football. It's, it's sort of like a, 
a, a cross between sort of mixed martial arts and like a sport with a goal you have to aim for. I wrote an article about a free SPN a few years ago, but you have the four like quarters of the city in theory, like come together and fight for the honor of their neighborhoods uh, every year. And in Siena, there's the Palio with the horse racing around the, the couple streets, which is a similar idea. And, and you get this all over the country, like loads of cities have this sort of tradition of basically, it's almost always four, four neighborhoods duke it out. And some of them are very serious, like Cacho Storico and the Palio di Siena. These are big sort of internationally known events that people travel the world to come and see. And in my dad's hometown, which is, you know, a thousand people, if we're being generous, it's really a village, not a town at all, I have the Palio del Uovo for <laughs> Easter, which is their annual tradition. And what it involves is teams from the four neighborhoods. I mean, again, a thousand people, if you're lucky. So neighborhoods is, is a stretch, but they, uh, they have like these, these egg fight battles. And it just really like struck me particularly this year because like everyone at the moment I don't, in England and I know in America as well is like fretting about how egg prices have gone up. <laughs> and here, just like a whole day of people smashing eggs. Yeah, they've got like these sort of, um, what would you call them? Like wooden structures set up like castles. And yesterday was the ladies' day, today is the men's day. And you have teams of it was, it was really more girls on ladies' day than, than women, I'd say. It was, it was teenagers. But they are teams and they like have to like knock each other's targets off the top of the walls, throwing eggs at each other. And there's another game where like they're standing, there's a small river that runs through town. They're standing on a log in the middle of the river and one of them's got to throw the egg to the other one. He's then got to throw it at a target while another one, a, a, the, the opposing team, defends the target with a pizza spade, like the pizza shovel they would use. <laughs> <laughs> I have had the best, I've had the best day yesterday watching <laughs> the Padre del Wolfo. There's more of it going on today. My uh, cousins are down there now and long live these sorts of traditions. And just reminding me, honestly, because it's been so many years since I've come for Easter in Italy, reminding me of the, the silly traditions that make this country so wonderful and make me feel very fond of my hometown. Nikki, go and take part. I, <laughs> You have to oh, represent one of the four neighborhoods. No, no, you, like, oh. they prepare for this, Mina. They prepare for this. It's not just show up on the day. Oh my God. Can you imagine? I can sort of hear that, like, you know, dun, like the Rocky theme. Dun, 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 you know. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. No, I mean, the music yesterday, at one point they were playing Wacka Wacka. So it was more like that. <laughs> that was the background music that was going on. Honestly, it was magic. It was the whole day was magic. I, I enjoyed it so much. So I just had to share that with sort of podcast, even though it's nothing to do with our show. <laughs> yeah, people always say, like, you know, like, what about your traditions? And I'm like, I don't know. If you're Arab, you just eat. That's like your tradition. <laughs> like, even if you're celebrating anything, you're just eating as well. So, <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, but that's so cool. I wish I could take part. But we did that too. Easter lunch lasted for, for five hours, which is, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. So just a regular lunch then. <laughs> do, do you celebrate Easter or, or not as much? We do get together on Easter. Well, just because also like what it like sort of there's nothing else to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But we got together. Uh, I have to say like usually some members of our household are fasting or something our, our household isn't <laughs> fasting so we're not very good about these things um, um but so yeah we just sort of celebrate Easter if that makes sense mm. yeah that's that's where we are but it's just a lot of family and that's why sometimes I need to go for like a walk and then reminisce about my life and maybe I just have the holiday blues at the moment everyone gets those and you did just have an amazing holiday I'm sure I'm gonna have the money get back from Italy but we should probably talk about the football, which has been my escape sometimes when you said about wanting to get some time on your own. I understand that as well when you've got lots of family. And perhaps for me sometimes this weekend, it's been, I have to go and watch the football now, which, um, you know, gets me out of uh, a certain amount of- A lot of stuff. Of everything's going on. Hey gang, just wanted to let you know that you can now get a free 14-day trial of our Chronicles Defosi Patreon membership. Subscribe now for free for 14 days to get access to all of our full episodes, solo minisodes, bonus content, even behind the scene bonuses like our chats about football and of course our chats about life in general. You can also get the entire bank catalog of Serie A Chronicles content. So head over to seriachronicles.com forward slash Patreon and subscribe to the Chronicles Fosy membership for free. We had some pretty big games. Actually, I think the biggest ones were really on Good Friday, which 
was sort of this sort of all the Champions League involved teams playing one after the other. And I think that's where I think we should start. There was obviously a big game on Easter Saturday as well. Uh, Lazio played Juventus. That was a big one. Let's start off talking about the Champions League games and then we'll get on to Lazio events. We'll get to all of them. Uh, so on Good Friday, we had Salernitana drew 1-1 with Inter. Lecce, um, sorry, Napoli won 2-1 away to Lecce. And Milan drew 0-0 with Empoli. And I almost feel like it makes best sense to talk about these two Milan club games together, Mina, just because they both are sort of, it feels like to me at the moment, in, in parallel, maybe spiral isn't the right word, but I can't think of a better one right now. They're in parallel falls at the moment. So Milan have dropped to fourth and Inter are down to fifth. There's one point between them, but Inter have not won in six games now across all competitions. Milan did win 4-0 away at Napoli, extraordinary result. But if you drop that result out, the other four of their last five games, they've taken like two points from them. So Mm. what's going on here, Mina? Is it that both these clubs have their eyes on the Champions League and they're just too distracted to play Brighton Serie A? Or are these completely separate stories we need to talk about separately? Here's the thing. I I, I think that when we're talking about sort of capitulations. I think Milan went through theirs just a little bit before we start realizing how strong Inters has become, um, their, their own mm-hmm. capitulation. Um, and I think a lot of what Milan had to do is the fact that they had players missing. They didn't have Ben always available. Obviously, Mike Manian had been missing for a long time and they ha- were relying on Tatu Rushanu. They had to change the tactics. Then Leao was going through sort of this bad streak, if you like, um, in the sense because, you know, the change of tactics didn't suit him. They are too reliant on Giroud or, and we, you know, we've talked about all of this and a lot of that happened to do with the World Cup and Teo Hernandez, for example. So it's about sort of them finding their feet again and going back to the way that they were. And I think they did do that against Napoli. And I do think that the real Milan sort of stood up and made sure that we still realize that they're available and that they are still tactically unpredictable and they are still fascinating and mesmeric to watch when it is the full team. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, like everyone's like, so what happened this time around? There's no point winning 4-0 against Napoli if you're then going to throw all your points away against Empoli. But they made five changes for that. And obviously, all eyes are on the Champions League. And this is where we talked about it last week in the sense that I said to you, it upsets me that they don't have the squad that they need to really battle it out on all different competitions because their first 11 can do some rather ridiculously brilliant stuff. But unfortunately for them, they just don't have the squad players that can fill in and rotate and allow them to sort of maintain that brilliance on the pitch. You know, it's different when you have the likes of Tiao or Rebic or Origi, who was heavily booed because everyone is still sort of not understanding what the point of him is. As a player who came on for Liverpool in various stages, he always made the difference. But in Milan, he's really struggling against the, the type of tactics and defensive schemes that Italian opponents perhaps have. And I just, I think that's what it is because when they did introduce their starters and they brought in Leao and they brought in Bahim Diaz, you could see Milan go back to being a really force to be reckoned with. So we know for them that it's a, it's a squad thing. They just don't have the squad. With Inter, on the other hand, I honestly don't know what's going on. It's like they have fallen off a cliff and they are drowning at the moment. Lukaku, I did not know this, right? But he's only scored three goals in Serie A, which I don't know why I hadn't realized. Maybe because he'd scored against Porto and I I didn't think it was that bad. But three goals, Mm -hmm. two of which are penalties. The last open, the goal that he last scored from open play was his first match against Lecce. Yeah. Like that's crazy, right? Like Sheko hasn't scored since January. Lautaro Martinez has gone on eight games without scoring a goal. And he's like, we know he's a little bit streaky. And I just... I kind of don't understand what's going on there. And like, you know, people are like, oh, he made the wrong substitutions. But I I sort of under, like you're changing Aslani and you're bringing in Brozovic. You're bringing in Lautaro Martinez. So how can these substitutions be bad in the match that they played against Salernitana? There's something really wrong there. And I'm afraid that if it continues, there's, I don't know how far down the table they're going to go because I'll be honest with you. I really like all the other teams, you know, but frankly speaking, I trust Inter in the Champions League. And if I'm choosing representatives to represent Italy in next year's Champions League, I want it to be the bigger teams. I'm sorry. I know that's not what people want to hear, but I certainly don't want it to be a side that I don't think will take the match seriously and then lose us coefficient points. 
I, I think there's a fascinating dynamic with that. And, and, and we'll save some of this, Mina, I think, for when we get to Lazio, because we are going to talk about them with the win of Juventus. But it, it is sort of really like interesting to me, like Maurizio Zari was pretty upfront about it when they went out of the Europa Conference League. Like, look, I don't think my squad's good enough to, to compete in this competition and the league. And I don't care about this as much as the league. Like he pretty yeah. much said that, right? Like he said, like, this matters more to me. And that's all fair enough, except for the goal of finishing the top four is that you go and play in another European competition. But that's worth it, right? Right. And, and, that's, and that's kind of, to bring it back to Milan for a second, I do actually think, I sort of teed you up to see what you thought, but I, I do actually think the Milan and Inter games are completely different stories, even though they're very mm. similar in some ways. Because the Milan game, as you alluded to, Pioli changed five players, including his entire attack. He dropped Leao, he dropped Giroud, and he dropped Brahim Diaz. Now, on the one hand, I look at that and think, you're a bit of a bloody idiot, aren't you? Because they were rubbish up front. They didn't create. They had a lot of shots in this game. The shot tally was like 26 to 2 or something ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. If you actually watch those chances, Parisan made a really good double save around the 15th minute. After that, he barely had a save to make. Almost all of those shots were not great, you know, like shots from outside the area, slightly sort of aimless attacking, not really well formed. Of course, by the end, Leao and Giroud never had come on and Giroud scored a handball, which got disallowed. But in general, I thought you can look at that game and say, look, you took out your entire attack and you paid a price for it. Was that smart to do? Well, we'll see at the end of the season. If you finish in the top four, it doesn't matter. You drop these points, it doesn't matter. You still finish in the top four. You're not going to win the league, so you're only trying to get into the top four. If you miss out on the top four, you might look at this game and say, well, you couldn't afford to do that. I know you had an eye, an eye on the Napoli game. I know you had an eye on the Champions League, but you couldn't afford to do that. So. So that's a question that almost I can't answer yet. But I do think it's certainly like a justifiable position. It's a position that you can argue from Pioli's shoes that, look, we're playing Napoli. We really want to win this quarterfinal. It's a Champions League quarterfinal and I want my best team to be as fresh as it can be. I can make that argument. I can go with you on that argument if, if that's what you're telling us. Inter's situation is different because Inter, this was not, the same as what I just said about Milan Empoli, where it's no real chance. Inter had a million chances. Inter could have scored a hundred <laughs> times over. And some of it yes. is like, it's hard to believe it's a witch's hex because when Romelu Lukaku hits the bar with a header from half an inch from the goal, and then I know. the follow-up comes and somehow Memo Ochoa, who hasn't really been at the top of his game for about five years, suddenly is appearing from nowhere and making another stop at his near post. You think, how, how on earth is this still happening? But when, it, when Inter, as, as you've been talking about for weeks, Mina, it's not a one-off. It's happening again and again. At some point, you have to be able to say, well, you know, that, that is on you as a team at some point. Here's the thing that I don't understand. Like, you mentioned this, you know, 23 shots, four on target for Mina. You get it, right? Mm -hmm. you, you just understand that the issue with Milan, if you're trying to cut it, you know, when you're trying to really look at it, is that the squad's not good enough. And if they don't have the starters that they need to play all the time, then this isn't a team that can really manage it in so many different competitions. And we know that people get tired. But with Inter, 25 shots, 11 on target. How? How does it happen that you score only one goal? How, how is this? Like, I just, I don't understand. I honestly genuinely don't understand. And this is where I go back to. And here's, but, but there's another thing about Milan that also irritates me too. They have 16 points dropped against teams in the second half of the table. Again, if you look at Inter's games, their most depressing games are those losses to like the likes of Spezia, Empoli, a draw to, I think it was Empoli, I'm starting to lose my mind now, a draw to Sampdoria. Like they've thrown so many, a draw to Salernitana, so many points down the, down the bin. Both of them managed wins against Napoli. Both of them managed wins against Juventus, albeit, okay, in the Coppa Italia for Inter, Actually, no, it's a draw. But you know what I mean? Like, as in my point is, is that they've done massively well in the Champions League. In the big matches, both teams have found themselves. So is it that they, is there a lack of motivation? That's the one common thread that I think it is between them two, is that they have thrown points away against the smaller sides. And this is where I wonder what's going on. With Milan, I could tell you, you know, maybe it is squad rotation. Maybe they're not taking the, these games seriously because they are dropping players like Leao for them and, and experimenting on a tactical level. But what worries me about Inter is now all the stuff that we've started to hear, right? Like De Vrij coming out and saying, I'm not happy with playing so little. Uh, with 
question marks being raised about the relationship that Inzaghi has with Lukaku and that Lukaku is not really happy at the way that things are going and they haven't yet found this rhythm and understanding in which he can express his potential at the moment under Inzaghi. Then you, you sort of look at the rest of the players because this is the point with Inter. Inter are a side that is very emotional and that's why they get to be called Pazza Inter. You know, a, a lot of the times what you have is sort of they self-combust in the middle. They're a little bit like France. When they're great, they can win everything, right? <laughs> you know, they can win the treble under Mourinho. They can win under Conte. But when they're bad and they start listening to these emotions, it sort of ends up being an Icardi, Spalletti, massive like catastrophe sort of type of situation and I'm scared that they're going down that route again because it seems like there's a lot of players there that aren't that happy about everything and whether it's Inzaghi whether whether it's I don't know what it is but there was this moment that you felt like they had really found themselves under Antonio Conte and it was it was just smiles and cheers and and now you look at Brozovic and you kind of feel like he's not really that interested in giving his best he's become very sort of one day he's brilliant. Most of the days he's kind of just mediocre. But El is always up in arms about everything going on. And, and maybe that's because he's one of the few that really cares at the moment. Then you sort of look around and, and you wonder, right, is this an Inzaghi thing or does Inter always have this problem? And that's why they always need to have a coach, like I've always said in the past, who has the BDE, you know, big dick energy. BDE, I know what you're after. <laughs> you know what I mean, you know? Just someone uh-huh. who's going to be so big that he basically like sucks this all away and makes it about himself. And and is that the difference? I, I know because I'm, I really need Inter to do better than this and I don't understand what's going on. Whereas with Milan, I understand it and I don't blame anyone there. I just blame the fact that they don't have, I mean, maybe it is obviously money is also an issue for Inter, but their team should be good enough to sort of start beating the likes of Serenitana. Big Antonio Di Natale energy. Um. <laughs> I would always say that for Inter, they're the one team, unlike me, Nan, maybe like Juve as well, that need a guy that's just a little bit more all-encompassing. I'm just saying if they had Allegri right now, I think they'd be challenging Napoli at the top. And I think all of these things are true. And yet also when you look at this game, I mean, this game's objectively ridiculous to analyse because Salerni Turner weren't great. Like, <laughs> this is not one of those stories of Salerni Turner brought an impressive performance. They defied the odds. They weren't great. Ochoa no. was brilliant, made some incredible yep. saves. And then out of nowhere, Antonio Crandreva in the 90th minute scores an equaliser, which by his own admission was a cross. He said it, it was a cross. I know, it's crazy. Di Marco punta l'uomo Candreva, si ferma, finta il cross, poi arriva di destro, ma il pallone è terzo, finisce il gol dopo una traiettoria meravigliosa e se vogliamo anche fortunata, Onana ci mette del suo e il pareggio, 45esimo minuto, il tiro cross, definiamolo così, di Candreva, coglie impreparato Onana il pallone a terra so sometimes it does feel like things just happen and somehow to Inter they happen most of all oh and it's crazy like it's really it's such bad luck and I feel like a lot of the times they've had like such bad luck you know like the whole universe has just sat there and thought right this time around Inter you're just nothing you're not going to get anything this season you know so I don't, I don't know what's going on I honestly don't know what's going on Sports Social Podcast Network. For the best TV viewing experience, witness the coziest maroons, the most vibrant and brightest moons, the eeriest and darkest tombs, and radiant and vivid hues in any type of room with the Neo QLED and OLED TVs by Samsung. We're supposed to say Samsung, but that didn't rhyme, so (laughs) you're welcome. Samsung, more wow than ever. 